It's Sunday, the 1st of August. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel, and we're slowly trucking our way back across the country after Oshkosh here landed here at Madison, South Dakota, in search of some inexpensive fuel, and found myself here at the Tail Dragger Training Mecca, and look who it is. It's Heidi Stepler. <laughs> this is her hometown airport. Say hi, Heidi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so... Give us a quick overview of the operation here. This is Morris. Morris Riggin at Riggin Flight Service. And I, he has how many aircraft? Approximately 20 that are flying right now with multiples in the shop getting ready to fly in a couple of years. <laughs> and you you help out here in, in the shop and as an instructor? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I'm instructing, you know, part-time on the weekends and stuff and when I have time off. So. And so, why do people like coming here? It's inexpensive, right? In it, well, inexpensive, but also uh, there's a lot of tailwheel airplanes. We even have a instrument trainer that's a tailwheel, so um, it's you get a lot of tailwheel time. And um, also, we have places where students can rent a place and stay. Like we only charge like twenty dollars a night and have an so apartment it, building. So, inexpensive lot. Yeah, so they can live here, or they can have their camper at the airport you know they don't have to rent a hundred dollar a night hotel yep and the planes are inexpensive too and the thing about his ag operation like you were explaining <clears throat> he uses smaller aircraft which are less expensive yes way less expensive and they're fully functional spray planes they have a, a sat satlock light star 2 system on there so you can learn how to follow the gps lines and then you have a spray, the Sorensen spray system on it, so you can actually spray water, um, and it's it's great. Good, good. Well, let's go find Morris and see what he's up to and get the story. <laughs> Riggin, Riggin, Riggin Air Service. Riggin Flight Service. Riggin Flight Service. Get it right, Brownie. <laughs> For multi-engine training, he uses three of these Apache aircraft. Piper Apaches. Here's Cessna 140, uses for a lot of the tailwheel instruction, and this is the one that's IFR certified. Getting the brakes changed out on it real quick. Look at that, you got an ILS in there. Wow. Full IFR, but by using a 140, it keeps your prices down. One of the things is the weather out here, the winter times, you're grounded for a bit of the no, time. No, no, you keep flying? No, fly every oh. day. It might be 30 <laughs> below, and <laughs> you have to have like the engine blankets stuffed beside you so that the crack of the door isn't by your leg because your leg will completely freeze. <laughs> and some uh, the Apaches are kind of hard because you have to go up high, 5,500 feet, so it's colder up there, and the heater doesn't always work. Yeah, so yeah, that's cold. There's times there was times where he could only fly for half an hour and my legs are so numb I couldn't feel them for a while after coming down. But it, sometimes there's, well, you've got to be always rebuilding aircraft. you got to keep the guys busy rebuilding yeah. aircraft yeah. in the slow times, if there is any slow times. And so here's some of the projects you're working on now. So what do you got, a J3? J3 that just came in. And yeah. That, um, is getting rebuilt yeah. after a little incident. Yeah. And then... This is amazing back here. You got this cub on floats, and are and do you launch it off of this yes, dolly? Yes, do. So how does it? T explain to us how that works. Yeah, because at one point uh, the airplane flipped over at night. A different different airplane flipped hmm. over at night. So we don't keep the airplane at the lake anymore. Oh. This one we actually have it on the trailer. So mm -hmm. the truck will pull the trailer down the runway. It'll launch it off. He'll fly off. You go fly at the lake all day, and at the end of the day, you come back and land in the grass, and that is so fun. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just a set of straight floats; yes. they're not amphibious floats. So you're literally just towing this thing at about what is it? What kind of speed do you need to get her up to? Fifty-five miles an hour. Fifty-five. Miles an hour. And so you got the engine running full speed ahead, fifty-five yeah. miles an hour, and you just haul back yeah, on the you stick. Yeah, keep and... that stick pushed forward as hard as you can uh -huh. so it doesn't tip back. Uh huh. Until you get to flying Until speed. Until you get to flying speed, because it'll then... try to tip back and try to yeah fall off the trailer but once you get her up to speed then you can haul back on yeah, and she just pops and right up pop off and get to the side real quick because oh, it's got some uh, turbulence behind the no, truck but because if you your engine quits oh, or yeah. maybe you didn't quite have flying speed you don't want to land on that trailer on again ever <laughs> <laughs> you want to land clear in the that trailer wow and then the grass is soft enough and smooth enough you just yeah. roll slide right on there you just don't want to touch the 
pedals really after you land because you don't want it to even if you're trying to keep it straight you have to make sure that you touch down completely straight and just let it go because you don't want to you don't want to wrench the the gear on it at mm. all so you want to keep it just let it go and it'll go it'll track the straight you're pointed which is yeah. why you want to be straight when you touch down there you go <laughs> wow and you kind of touch down you have your nose down you're at like cruising because oh. you want to touch down on the fronts of the floats. You're not doing a big either. flare in that operation. No, though. not at all. You don't want to flare. You want to touch down completely level. And then it doesn't roll very far. Well, yeah, it I doesn't bet. roll at all. It's slide. It doesn't <laughs> <Yeah>. slide very far. <laughs> it just comes to a quick stop. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but we got lots of grass around here. The grass runway plus the sides of the paved runway. Plenty of grass to land on. But yeah, there's lots of grass areas to land on. <laughs> The store is in the other hangar, uh -huh. right in the corner. So this one's going to get recovered this this yeah. winter. <laughs> yes, it's starting to. <laughs> but it's 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 flyable. We just we got to protect and get her. Well, here he is, Morris Riggin himself. How many years have you been doing this now? Well, I started, I soloed it on my 16th birthday, so, you know, 40 some years. Wow, and was this a family operation? Yeah, my dad actually started it right after World War II. Wow, and uh, we were counting the fleet there, looks like some 20 aircraft or so now. Yeah, they told me I have 30 some, but I think they're hiding someplace, but I, I have 30 some. You got plenty of barns around here, yeah. I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. And tell me about those two Call Airs. Call Air was the predecessor. Wasn't that part of the Aviat Husky? Isn't that part of their lineage now? Well, the uh, the Aviat, the Husky is built in the same factory that Call Air, the Call Brothers started back in Afton, Wyoming. Okay, so, so that's the connection. Yep. There's maybe a little more connection because when they were designing the Husky, I believe they maybe have hired an engineer that worked for the Call Brothers, I think they brought him out of retirement. Because if you look at the wing and the wing attach, or the mm. uh, aileron attached fittings and how the flaps are fit, yeah, those are the, the same person designed those. Ah, you could tell by looking yeah. at them, huh? We gotta go check out those airplanes. All right, good. And so the, the key thing here is that you're, this is an old school aviation place that that you can get old school aviation training, especially tail dragger training, you can't find anywhere else around the country. And Morris made a good point. If you bought a tail dragger recently and you don't, you didn't grow up in tail draggers, now you're gonna need a lot of training or you're gonna have troubles with it. Um, it's easier for you to just come out to here, right? And get a oh, tail yeah. wheel endorsement because he doesn't have the time yeah. or the personnel to go meet you and fly your new airplane. So just come on out to here, and what, what what can you hook them up with? Well, we have two Cessna 140s, so if you bought one of those, we have six Piper Cubs, so if you bought one of those, we have a 150 horsepower Champ. So we kind of have one of everything that you could buy, or something that would be real similar to fly, like a Citabria, the, our 150 Champ is just the predecessor to the Citabria line. Yep, and so how long would a guy, a guy, a knucklehead that's really hard to train, how, how long is he going to spend out here? Well, and I tell everybody, so they call and they say I want to get checked out in a tail dragger. So the first thing I ask them is their flying time. And, and you know, the Cherokee pilots are going to kill me, but I own two <laughs> Cherokees, so you can't give me too hard a time. But if they have Cherokee time, usually it's twice as long as if they've flown a 150 or something lighter. Um, Mostly because our little tail draggers are really light and the wind affects them. So even though they may know how to do a crosswind landing, like in a Cherokee, once you get all three wheels on the ground, it's over with. But in our little, you know, in a cub that only weighs 800 pounds, that's just actually when all the work starts. Yep, yep. And you get plenty of crosswind practice out here. You have plenty of practice yeah. in the wind out we, here. We have wind. It's, sometimes it's a hot wind. Sometimes it's a cold wind. And, but we ha always have wind. Yeah, so you, you'll learn up quick. All right, Morris Riggin of Riggin Air Service. Did I say that right? Riggin Flight Service. Riggin Flight Service. Yep.
Come on out here, you can get you all the way through. You're the DPE now, so you can get through all your ratings here. Yeah, and we have a testing center. Um, I even bought an apartment complex for our students to stay in, so you don't have to go any place once you come here. Yep, you're set, and it's affordable. The last bastion of affordable flight training here in America. All right, thanks, Morris. Thank you. Uh huh. Now, in the old days, you're saying that every airport out here typically ran what sort of an operation? Well, back in the 40s and 50s, um, almost every little airport had a spray operation. Mm -hmm. um, they were World War II pilots, and so they they had to have something, especially up in this country, to do, to do eight months out of the year. So they'd take the spray system out of the cover of the champ, and then they'd give lessons with it the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, Dad had two Super Cubs, and so as soon as spring come along, we put spray system on it. The students would stop for a little bit and they'd go spray and then as soon as the spray season was over with they'd put they'd take the spray system back off and he'd continue giving flying lessons so nowadays um you'll find a couple of turbines at an airport and they're doing the work of 10 of the little airplanes so those pilots are typically kind of full-time ag pilots they might travel a lot more than we used to do mm -hmm. anyway so uh, but they're not instructing anymore. They're not instructing yeah. anymore. They just don't do that. Huh. So there, where are all the qualified tail dragger old school instructors? Yeah, they're, they're just, it's a dying breed. Yeah. But, so I run my place just like Dad run his. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I don't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Dad treated it like, um, I still have people, he still has a, a couple of students he taught to fly in the 60s that are still alive. Yeah. And they call me monthly to check up, see what's going on. Yeah. But they became friends also. See? Yeah. Yeah. And then during the off season, you're doing restorations and keeping people busy. And, and that's another thing, you know, the World War II mechanics are gone. Yeah. So there's, gosh, we used to, there's, again, when I was a kid, half the airports had a mechanic. Yeah. And um, you could take your fabric airplane to them. They'd fix it up. You know, shop rate. I think Dad was getting in the in the 60s like 4 or $5 an hour for the instructor and about that for the airplane, uh, you know, for a J3 or 90 Super Cup. Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, so those guys are gone. So, but yet we, we still have a lot of fabric airplanes. In fact, a lot of the home belts yeah. are fabric airplanes. So mm -hmm. they have to learn those skills all over again. And round engine skills and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, round engine skills. Yeah. <laughs> Those guys are dying off. Yeah. Because there again, it used to be all the big spray planes were round engine, now they're turbines. Yeah. So you can't run over and ask a question to the mechanic who's mm. taking care of it. So, and you can't even call those guys anymore. Yeah. You know, they're gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's an example of some lighter aircraft that are set up for crop dusting using the Sorensen system that was so very common back in the day. And this is a, a, a sort of a system that you can remove off of the aircraft and you can then use the aircraft for flight instruction or coyote hunting during the rest of the season and continue to try to make a living. But these Sorensen spray systems, <laughs> parts are getting so hard to find. Boris, what did you end up doing? Well, so I actually, in Worthington, Minnesota is where they're from. So I called, the phone number was still active. I called, it was like 8 o'clock at night. He picked up the phone and I said, well, I need some fairings and a few parts. And the fellow who owned it, he said, well, if you come over, go through the buildings, you know, I think I got them. So I drove over, we went through it, and I was telling him, well, this tank is for this, this is for that. And to make the story a little shorter, I ended up buying this, the whole company just so I could get an arm full of parts. <laughs> so if you need Sorensen spray parts to this day, you come see Morris here. At yeah, and actually I just sold a tank for a Cessna and it, it was going to be field approved on a 185 and they were going to use it for uh, fuel. Mm -hmm. And um, I still get calls from Central America, um, Africa. I still sell spray systems for Cessnas. And up to Alaska, they still use them for uh, transporting fuel or they make uh, cargo pods out of them. Huh. And so the system, here's your spray bar, here's your sprayers located here. You got to add struts to the wings there. You got your tank down here. It's a 90 gallon or so tank fiberglass. In the early days, they used a um, aluminum tank in the back seat. 
And then here with your, just a standard old automotive radiator fan is a air driven water pump that moves the chemical through the system, pressurizes it and gets the chemical moving out to the spray bars. And then is this your GPS? It is. Right there. So when dad bought this airplane in 1974, he paid 6,500 for it with a low time engine. We flew it home, all the way home. He was pretty sure he'd never come out on that. He paid too much for a Super Cup. Oh boy. But that GPS system I bought cost me 6,000 to buy that. <laughs> just, so I, I don't even, he'd probably look at me like, well, I think you've gone crazy, son. <laughs> Yeah, but if he's if he'd seen the price of Super Cubs today, well, it wasn't. You know, seventy four. He paid sixty five hundred, and and by seventy nine they were twelve thirteen thousand. He goes, boy, people are nuts. <laughs> he says, who would pay twelve thousand for a Super Cub? And then pretty soon they were twenty five, and then yeah. and you know now one hundred and fifty, one hundred two hundred thousand for a Cub. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. We got a couple other neat planes back here. This is the PA eleven, correct? Yep. That that's the Cub special. That's the uh, yeah. This is a Super Cub without b the flaps. Or it's a uh, it's a lighter version of the original ninety horse Super Cub. Yeah. So what Piper did is they took the J three and they fixed some of the deficiencies. Like um, it's hard to see over the nose in the J three. Hmm. So they took the nose tank out, put a wing tank in, and then put an enclosed cowl. So you can literally see over the nose in in the PA eleven. Mm hmm. And yeah. this one you're going to use for uh, instruct tailwheel instruction, but it used to be a spray plane it, as well. Yeah, and, and it was used for Predator to control out west by Pierce, South Dakota. Uh-huh. And then over here is a real unusual, look at this, a Champ. It's not an Aronka Champ. It's which model Aronka is it? Well, it's a, it was built by Champion Aircraft mm -hmm. in Osceola, Wisconsin, so it's a 7GC. 7GC with what size engine? 150 horse like Omi. 150. And what size tank on this one? That, this is 65 on this one. I just happen to have the 65 tanks. Okay, so it, it and it bolted right on there. And now are you using these for, in, primarily it's just for instructional purposes? Yeah, that's all we use it for. Although I did take the Super Cub out the other day and I sprayed a 40 acre um, plot that, you know, if I would have taken the A-cap with 600 horse and flown an hour, I would have lost money. Uh -huh. So, and then besides, it's fun for me because that's what I started spraying in. So yeah, once yeah. a year, I like to go do something to my cub. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Great trainers. And this is what helps keep the cost of this kind of ag training down. Most operators nowadays throw you right in a big expensive ag airplane. And yeah, even, even when you go get turbine transition training in the simulator, they charge more per hour than we do in the, in real the airplane. actual airplane. And the stick and rudder yeah. skills yeah, are you, fundamentally the same. Yep. You have to, you know, we have ball, you know, slip skid indicators yep. in each airplane because, um, you fly a Cherokee or 172 and they tell you to try to keep the ball centered, but it, it kind of keeps it self-centered. And that's another thing is with the, where they get in these little airplanes that are rudder airplanes and the ball goes all over. I, I've had people look at me and say, there's something wrong with your airplane <laughs> because I'm a pretty good pilot in my Cherokee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's no. like, so, so I tell them, okay, so if, if you can fly my cub for the first hour and keep the ball centered, you know, I won't charge you for it. And I've never given a free hour away. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We're in the uh, 1966 A9 Call Air, the, the factory out of Afton that uh, Husky eventually took over, or Aviat. And this is what they use. It's This is the finishing school airplane for the ag students. This is the aircraft that they use to finish up their training in solo. It's got all the systems of any typical modern ag plane, including the GPS light bar up there. That's a wire cutter right there. Uh, he's got a smoke system right here. If you got to check your drift, you, you pop a little smoke and check for that. And just, and then the hopper's right up there. And just an easy to land an easy to handle tail dragger. Now here's your spray on and off. Here's your emergency dump, but here's your flaps right here. And the call air has flapper ons. And when you're heavy in the call air, you want to operate with one notch of flaps like that. 
Do you see those ailerons droop with, with the flaps? You, they still work as ailerons, but they're drooped. Yep, now go to full flaps and you'll see. You'll really see it go. Yep. There's the flap more. That, that's full flap right there. Yep. Full span flapperons. The drawback to that is. Yeah. Go full left aileron now. Very little actually. Oh, yeah. Up aileron. Ah. Huh. Lots of down ailerons, so lots of adverse yaw. Lots so, of adverse yaw, so lots of rudder. Yep, yep. Wow. You can tell the folks at Aviat pulled one of the engineers out of retirement from Call Air to design that flap system. It gives it sort of a semi-fowler flap action without spending a lot of money. Those are real head knockers on the Husky. Well, thanks so much for the tour to, today, guys. And uh, if you're interested in this, check them out. What's the uh, website? Rigandflightservice.com. Rigandflightservice.com. You'll even see Heidi on camera there. <laughs> <laughs> see you here.